The conventional wisdom that poor households don't or can't save simply isn't true. That's one of the key lessons from the last decade of research on the financial lives of poor households. For poor families whose income flow is often erratic and unpredictable, savings are a vital form of consumption smoothing and insurance. Weather, medical issues, and poor prospects for paid labor can all cause major disruptions to the financial health of poor families. But having a stockpile of savings helps in getting through those rough patches. Poor families do save. They just save in small amounts for short periods of time, adding to and spending down savings very frequently. While poor households do save, building up to a significant lump sum remains a major challenge. Banks and formal institutions often do not offer savings products to the poor because their small deposits and frequent transactions do not cover the cost of servicing accounts. For rural populations, not having a nearby bank branch is another obstacle to formal savings. Without a bank account, how can the poor have a reliable, safe system to build savings? Savings groups developed in many cultures around the world as an effective and low-cost mechanism for poor households to build up lump sums. There are a lot of variations, but the basic model for a savings group is simple. A small group of individuals, usually well-known to each other already, agrees to meet at a regular time, usually weekly. At each meeting, members make a set deposit into the communal pot. If there are 10 members and each contributes $10, the pot reaches $100. One member receives the $100, and group members then take turns receiving the pot at each meeting. There are many variations to savings groups in terms of the way savings are handled. Some groups loan out each week's pot with interest. Others don't distribute the total until a set time. Some groups allow members to bid for when they will receive the pot. But what all groups have in common is they help members accumulate savings by breaking down a large sum into smaller, regular payments. Though they are generally called savings groups, there is also an element of borrowing. A member who gets the pot early is borrowing money from other members and repaying it over a few weeks, much like microcredit. But whether it looks like credit or savings, the distinguishing features of savings groups are the mechanism of breaking down large sums into smaller ones and the social support to follow through on a plan. Savings groups are very cheap to start, and communities can organize and manage them without external organizations. They evolved organically in many different parts of the world. Today, a number of charities and some microfinance institutions have begun formalizing or at least supporting savings groups. While savings groups are mostly managed by their members, these organizations have provided training, help setting up groups, and or services to collect, record, and safeguard deposits. Even though savings groups help to meet an unmet need of providing financial services for the poor, they are not without drawbacks. The timing of payouts might not coincide with when a member needs the money the most. Members may also be vulnerable to mismanaged funds, theft, or insolvency. Despite these drawbacks, savings groups work. A raft of research has shown that this simple innovation created by poor households is effective at helping people save more.